Thank you very much. It is an enormous uh, privilege to be here, to have a chance to address this distinguished audience, to be introduced uh, so generously, to be introduced without a Thomas joke. <laughs> it was not so long ago that I was introduced by the guy who said, Larry, do you know what it takes to succeed as an economist? And I said, no. And he said, an economist is someone who's pretty good with figures, but doesn't quite have the personality to be a chartered accountant. <laughs> <laughs> that was in Moscow, and no one got the joke. <laughs> Anyone who doubts the importance of what we economists try to, <laughs> try to understand and try to address need only come to Ireland. Your story for the last 20 years has been a story of the economics going well, economics going too well, economics going unsustainably well, that which is unsustainable not being, un not being sustained, and severe consequences following from that, and then the economic challenge being over and over. The thing I am always most convinced and concerned to teach my students is that economics is not a game. These are diagrams and abstractions, but they are about things that are very, very real and that the lives of hundreds of thousands of people are affected for good or will or ill when national finances and national financial arrangements are made wisely or made unwisely. And so the topic of financial arrangements is a concern to much more than financiers. The debate over macroeconomic policies is a concern to much more than macroeconomists. And few debates over macroeconomic policy have been as consequential, or will, I believe, be as consequential in the next few years as discussions of the Euro and of European monetary arrangements. So I want to reflect on that topic from the perspective of a concerned American who has worked closely with European colleagues and friends on global financial uh, issues for more than two decades. I must report to you at the outset that if you had told me and my ministerial colleagues in Europe during the late 1990s, that a dozen years from now, Brazil would be borrowing money at a quarter of the risk premium that Spain would be borrowing money at, that Mexico would be borrowing money at a quarter of the spread at which uh, at which Italy would be borrowing money. That there would be intervals in which Colombia would be borrowing money with a lower risk spread than France. And that the IMF would have, large, would have launched the three largest programs in its history for members of the European Monetary Union we would have found that to be an inconceivable 
set of events. And so I think it is important before looking forward to reflect broadly backwards on the European project, on European Monetary Union, how we came to this point, and how this crisis is being uh, managed. I would start with this observation. <clears throat> the success of the European Union over the last 60 some years is one of mankind's greatest triumphs. My Harvard colleague Stephen Pinker has written a book, a very powerful book, I believe, entitled The Better Angels of Our Nature. It argues that the long sweep of human history is towards reductions in violence and brutality. It makes observations like the observation that the incidence of murder in the most primitive societies is five times or ten times as great as the incidence of murder in the worst of contemporary inner cities. It looks at the extent of brutality on any number of measures. And it argues that if you take the long view, there has been a downwards trend in violence. That view would have appeared ludicrous in 1945. What ended in Europe in 1945 was only the most violent and tragic of a millennium's worth of conflicts. No century had passed without major violence between the nations of Europe and few half centuries had passed, and what happened during the First World War was the worst that had ever happened, and what happened during the Second World War was much worse than that. It was far from obvious that that pattern would end, and yet Today, for all of the problems, war between the nations that were protagonists during the Second World War, today is inconceivable. That is a reflection of many things. It's a reflection of the horror of what had preceded. But the horror of what took place during the First World War was not sufficient to bring about that uh, objective. It is a reflection of the efforts of the United States. It is, above all though, a reflection of a grand and broad project of bringing the nations of Europe together. First, through a coal and steel community. Then, through a common market, through also a security alliance in which the United States played a key role, directed and prevailing in the struggle against uh, communism. Ultimately, through the end of the Cold War and the reunification of all of them. One can only admire support, praise, and approve that broad European integration project. There was, to be sure, an enormous political logic to the idea that became fashionable in, initially in the late 1980s. That one could complement a common market 
with a common currency. There was great symbolic appeal to the idea that a union that was increasingly going to be without boundaries would increasingly use a common money. There were legitimate and real arguments that a common uh, currency would reduce frictions and further the objective of international integration. It was reasonable to suppose that the process of convergence between the richer and poorer nations, and especially the convergence upwards of the poorer nations, would be accelerated by a common currency and greater integration. For all of these, it was reasonable to suppose that currency volatility would be inimical to free trade and substantial economic integration, and to suppose also that fixed yet potentially changeable exchange rates would be the object of intermittent speculative attacks with serious consequences for governments and hardly attractive benefits for speculators. And so the urge to merge, if you like, uh, represented by the uh, common currency uh, project was a compelling one. To be sure, economists, especially economists on my side of the Atlantic, were very skeptical. They very much were aware of all of the benefits that I have just described and were very much aware of the political uh, benefits of European unification. But they had two broad concerns. First is the concern that comes out of what might be what is called in the economics literature the idea of the optimal currency area. The notion broadly is that choosing a currency area requires, on the one hand, balancing the fact that a common currency is good because it promotes trade, reduces frictions, <coughs> with the idea that when you have a common currency, you can't have a differentiated monetary policy. And sometimes you need to have a differentiated monetary policy. Historically, there have been two broad ways in which systems have worked. One is the way that, in my country, New York and Mississippi work. New York and Mississippi are very different places, but they share a common currency. When there are good times in New York and bad times in Mississippi, the federal government collects substantially more taxes from New York and substantially less taxes from Mississippi. And in effect, there are substantial transfers from New York to Mississippi. When there are good times in New York and bad times in Mississippi, mobile populations adjust their movements so that more people stay in New York and fewer people move to Mississippi. And so the shock is buffered both by federal transfers and by substantial mobility of labor. Another way in which difference can be handled is the way in which it is handled between Detroit and Toronto. There are no substantial fiscal transfers between Americans and Canadians. There is very little mobility on net between America and uh, Canada. But when the price of oil goes, price of oil and commodities goes up, and so good things are happening in, in Canada, the Canadian currency rises, Canadian producers become less competitive, American uh, producers become more competitive, production relay, relocates to America, and greater competitiveness is achieved. 
there was the real concern that a European Monetary Union would combine the monetary arrangements of the United States with the inflexibilities and lack of fiscal transfers of the United States and Canada, and therefore give rise to substantial problems when there were relative shocks. There was also a concern of what might be called common pool problems. Imagine that all of us went to dinner together tonight, and the rules were that we would each pay 185th of the check. Very likely, none of us would be ordering chicken. More of us would be ordering beef, and the fine wines would be selected from the restaurant menu. Now imagine that we were each, as part of our 185th, permitted to invite guests, perhaps paying guests, to join us for dinner. Pretty soon the whole population of Dublin would be joining us for dinner because after all, somebody would be happy to pay $10 to be on my tab, but if I was only gonna have to pay 185th of their tab, it would be very much uh, worth it for me. With a common currency, with government debt on which it was nearly unimaginable that there would be default, with at least a substantial element of common concern about banking systems. There was the concern that all would draw on the reservoir of common credibility, and that that reservoir would come to be depleted. What happened? I think it is fair to say that political figures show a different degree, different and greater degree of deference to engineers than they do to economists. They recognize that when, that if a bridge across a river is politically imperative, but engineers say that it will collapse, you can't really build the bridge. But there was the conviction that because the will was strong enough, the economic problems would somehow be managed if they arose and would not prove too serious. And so, as a politically driven decision, monetary union moved ahead. What happened? This was as classic a case as any I have ever seen of my late teacher Rudy Dornbush's dictum that in finance, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought that they could. <laughs> For the first decade, the euro worked much better than most economists expected. There was, I think it's fair to say, substantial, I told you so, if not crowing, on the part of many European statesmen who noted that huge flows of capital had moved successfully at low cost, driving apparent rapid rates of economic growth to the European periphery, that speculative attacks had been avoided, that the performance of the European economies had been strong, that the distress predicted by so many economists had not materialized. That was the story for the first decade. <clears throat> but it has not been the story of the second decade. Experience has revealed that significant parts of the capital flow to the poorer countries of Europe were unsustainable with terrific rates of debt repayment 
being achieved primarily through foreign bar through further borrowing rather than through the development of the capacity to repay. It was observed that over time substantial competitive imbalances um, were took place that were masked by substantial capital flows that went into real estate and other forms of domestic production. It was observed that financial institutions were, once the tide of increased capital flows stopped, in much less healthy shape than had previously been imagined. And it was observed here in Ireland, among other places, that in ways that had previously been not just unappreciated, but not imagined, the financial health of governments was far more dependent on the financial health of banking systems than anyone could previously have uh, supposed. And so, triumph gave way to crisis. A judgment was reached initially uh, that followed the classic pattern in response to financial crisis. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote famously of the reactions that people have when they learn they have terminal diseases. First, there is denial. Then there is rage. Then there are attempts to bargain. And finally, there is acceptance of the reality. And something parallel operates in finance. Denial takes the form of saying that it is a confidence problem and that if we simply assert that everything is okay, it will be okay. Rage takes the form of blaming the speculators and seeking to ban short selling. Bargaining takes the place of announcing that if we have program, that we will have programs, we will have plans to have plans, but not actually implementing measures. And acceptance takes the form of concrete programs to drive things forward. Where has Europe been and where is Europe going? That is for Europeans, not Americans, to decide. I was asked constantly in uh, 1999 as Treasury Secretary what the American view about European Monetary Union was. And the answer I always gave was that we support the Europeans. Our interests are aligned. If European Monetary Union works for Europe and creates a more prosperous, more successful Europe, it will work for America. And those words were carefully chosen to be very supportive, but not committal of my conviction that the experiment would prove entirely successful. What happened? Describe what happened. Whatever the merits, whatever the merits of the initial decision to move to monetary union, whether the set of measures to promote fiscal discipline, to urge integration, to drive structural uh, reform, to support transfers and labor mobility. Whatever the wisdom of that constellation of decisions. Seems to me that a thoughtful observer has to include, has to conclude that the formation of monetary union like the adoption of a child, is an irrevocable act. And is not an act that can prudently or morally 
be reversed and cannot be reversed without catastrophic consequences. I do not believe that there is a great enough prospect that monetary divorce could be managed without tremendous ill effect to suppose that that is a realistic strategic choice to be entertained as a choice. I believe that is the judgment that Europe has come to, and I believe that it is very much an appropriate judgment. The question remains, though, what is a strategy forward? And it must be recorded that an observer like myself who wishes the project well but is able to maintain some degree of detachment sees in some of what has taken place a pattern all too reminiscent of U.S. decision-making during the Vietnam War. Daniel Ellsberg, the uh, progenitor of the Pentagon Papers, wrote a famous essay about the Vietnam War entitled The Stalemate Myth and the Quagmire Machine, which he described how at every crucial juncture during the Vietnam War, every crucial juncture, policymakers were told that if they did nothing, the system would collapse, there would be surrender, there would be national humiliation for the United States and defeat for South Vietnam. That in order to have a realistic prospect, no guarantee, but in order to have a realistic prospect of achieving our war objectives, we would need to take steps A, B, and C. <laughs> and then there would be a prospect that we could succeed. But those steps would be very painful in terms of both the domestic politics and the international politics. And then they were, and then policymakers did not like either of those alternatives. And so they would ask, what is the minimum that I must do to avoid catastrophe in the next six months? And they would then be told that it was to do some of A and a bit of B, and you could probably <laughs> skip C, and things would last for six months. And that was the choice they always took until it all collapsed around them and the helicopters left Saigon. If one watches what has taken place in Europe since May of 2010, one can discern a cycle playing out at an accelerating rate. First there is tension, then there is anxiety, then there is potential financial crisis in the periphery, then there is a summit, then there is difficulty reaching an agreement at the summit. Then there is a fever pitch of tension that is given release by an agreement. Then there are measures taken. Then there is relief. Then there is a rally in markets. Then there is self-satisfaction, if not congratulation, on the part of participants. Then there is relaxation, complacency, and relatively calm markets. Then there is a little bit of warning that this was good, but the problem has not fully been resolved. Then there were rising spreads in credit markets. Then there was growing anxiety. Then there was another summit. There have been about four of those cycles 
since May of 2010. I do not believe that we can confidently suppose that we have seen the last of those cycles. It may be the case that measures are now in place which will avert severe financial collapse of major financial institutions or major sovereigns. That is not assured, but it is possible. What is almost certainly the case is that measures are not in place that will drive adequate growth for social cohesion, for significant declines in debt ratios, or for improvements in middle class standards of living. The painful truth is that virtually every financial crisis with fiscal, that has been resolved with fiscal consolidation in the last half century has taken place with a substantial decline in real exchange rates. A measure that is not possible within a monetary union without radical deflation. A measure that is much more difficult without growing markets in which to export. What does all of this suggest? It suggests that policy in the European Union needs in the months ahead to focus increasingly on growth rather than on austerity something that has strong implications for structural and regulatory policy. It suggests that austerity is not a growth strategy. Yes, fiscal consolidation has at some times and some places been a significant contributor to growth. Those were times and places in which it was possible to bring down interest rates rapidly. Those were times and places in which credit could be made substantially available to businesses wishing to invest. Those were times and places in which a falling currency and buoyant global markets could support substantial exports. That in the current time and place where none of those things are possible, it cannot be supposed that austerity constitutes a growth strategy. It may at some points be an economic necessity, but it is not and cannot be relied on as a growth strategy. Third, it suggests that central efforts to reduce the magnitude of adjustment that are necessary are essential for European growth. These take two forms. They take one form, which one might call the federal dimension, or the micro dimension, of the form of financial arrangements within Europe for supporting governments, and for supporting banking systems. No positive function is served, as Keynes famously warned in Economic Consequences of the Peace, by charging interest rates at rates <laughs> that require transfers of a kind that countries cannot make. And that's why attention to levels of interest associated with public sector debts has been appropriate. And that's why attention to the provision of support to banking systems through governments or directly from central European mechanisms is profoundly <clears throat> important. The other dimension 
goes to the question of European wide uh, policy. Is it appropriate that policy be oriented to maintain low inflation in the most rapidly growing countries? There is room for <coughs> there is room for debate about whether an average inflation rate for the European Union of 2% is sufficient given the magnitude of the debt challenges that are faced. I do not believe there is room for debate as to the wisdom of a 2% inflation rate and only a 2% inflation rate in the countries that are structurally likely to enjoy the highest rate of inflation when there is a need for substantial relative price adjustment within the unit. Similarly, the only propositions of which economists can be absolutely certain are the basic budget identities. And one of them is that the sum total of all imports has to equal the sum total of all exports. To suppose that the indebted countries can import substantially less and export substantially more without major adjustment in the surplus countries is simply to wish the problem away. Adjustments must be of essentially equal magnitude in surplus and deficit countries. And it is incumbent on those calling on deficit countries to adjust, to provide a theory of how surplus countries are going to adjust as well. For Europe to suppose that all of that adjustment or the lion's share of that adjustment can take place outside of Europe at a time when the world economy is struggling, at a time when the United States remains in substantial trade deficit, is, I think, to make an unreasonable supposition. And so European debates need to move beyond morality tales about austerity to serious contemplation of the underlying economic arithmetic of growth. None of this is easy. None of this will be politically entirely welcome. But much that is said about the European Union emphasizes various aspects of the politics, and I do not minimize the importance of the politics. But I would suggest that part of the reason, and this is why I dwelt on the history, that we are at our difficult point, is that decision-making privileged politics and desire over the ineluctable implications of economic arithmetic. And if we are going to find a way forward more successfully, I believe that the underlying economic arithmetic of the need for growth and the reality that adjustment of deficits cannot take place without adjustment of surpluses needs to be more central in our discussions going forward than it has been in the past. I began by remarking on the success of the European Union as one of the great chapters in the history of mankind by emphasizing how supportive the United States was of it. That was true after the Second World War. That was true after the Cold War. It is with the rise in China as more true today than it ever has been in the past. All right-thinking Americans, whatever their political party, whatever their precise judgment on a range of tactical issues, wish Europe well 
at this crucial juncture. Thank you very much.